Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In the last lecture, Mr. David Campbell he started discussing about Swath Atlas and various comparisons of DIA versus DDA methods. You are also introduced to the concepts of DIA and the softwares and tools available for analyzing DIA data sets. The Swath Atlas contains high quality ion libraries for use in Swath or DIA experiments. In today's lecture, you will be provided an overview of the features available on Swath MS and how you can utilize this valuable resource for analyzing your mass spectrometry data. So, let us welcome again Mr. David Campbell for his today's lecture. So, this is DIA libqc. Basically, what we have is we have an ion library, we have it in a variety of different formats. We have a SWATS file, and the SWATS file basically says, okay, I'm going to look from this mass to this mass, and, and I'm going to, you know, basically the width of each bin. Um, and you can also uh, compare it to a proteome. So, basically, you've taken a proteome and you digest it, and you have all the triptych peptides. You basically run this thing, and you get this ion library, su I, excuse me, ion library sum summary in tabular format. Um, and so these are the different criteria. Um, library complexity is sort of how big the library is, uh, how many peptides, how many peptide ions. There's precursor information, so what is the average length of the peptides in the library? Um, how many modifications are there? What kind of modifications? Fragment characteristics, you know, what ions do you have, B or Y? Uh, how many fragments do you have per peptide? Retention time is a very important part of any sort of targeted or scheduled uh, type analysis. You do not want to look over the entire retention time range. So, how much does it vary? Is it consistent? Um, do you have marker peptides or these things called IRT peptides? Um, library completeness, you compare it to a proteome. How many of the proteins in that proteome do I cover? And library correctness. So, it turns out that there are certain things with relation to the SWATH file or relation to the, uh, the actual M disease that are being reported. Um, are, is this library in, in fact correct? Um, so, basically, I'm going to go through these very briefly. Um, and so, I have two different libraries depicted here. So, this is the PHL, the Pan Human Library. And this is, this is again, taken from all these different experiments. Everything was run on a, a pretty modern instrument, the uh, ABCIX uh, Triple TOF 5600. Um, and you can see that there's some 211,000 peptide ions. So, again, a peptide ion is a primary sequence plus modification plus charge. Um, and there are, you know, almost 3 million fragments. So, the other thing I have is I basically took this PHL and I applied our swaths. So, so now, because, because they used, they had a, a, when they did DDA, they were looking at wider M to Z ranges. Um, in addition, uh, we were looking at these 100 swaths and so we do not want any any fragment ions in our precursor windows. And what is more, we actually took the top six um, fragments. So, we want to specifically take just the top six. And so, you can see that going from here to here, we did not lose that many ions. So, by applying maybe some more stringent mass filters, we did not lose that many ions. But if you look at the number of fragments, we have way fewer fragments, almost, you know, something like 35 or 38 percent um, only of the fragments. And that is because now we only have up to six fragments per peptide. And oh, actually, I have got ahead of myself here. So, so, um, yes. So, I have, I have confusingly, I have put it down in this section. So, this is the number of stripped peptides, we would say. So, this is just the number of total peptides. And again, these two numbers are pretty close. But if you look at this number 149 up to 211, that are, those are things that we saw, say, both oxidized and unoxidized or, uh, or multiple charge states of the same peptide. That is actually pretty common, especially plus 2 and plus 3. Um, so, yeah. So, again, the, the peptide characteristics are how many peptides did we see, what sort of modifications, what percentage of the peptides are modified, things like that. Um, 
This is a big one. So basically, this is the number of fragments. And as I told you, uh, so this is the PHL. The average number of fragments is about 13, whereas the new library, it's exactly 6. And that's because we, we wanted to know, we were comparing these different softwares, and we wanted to ensure that all the different software used the same peaks to do their analysis. And so most of them use six fragments by default. And so we limited our library to six so that they would all be on equal footing. Um, but you can see the percentage in charge two and charge three. And you know, sometimes going from the, the all to the, the modified library, you do actually see a swing in the percentage. And, and you know, I don't really know why that would be. But um, you, know, you, you might expect you'd see fewer charge three because uh, you know, basically m to z might fall below now the, the lowest uh, m to z value that we're looking for. Uh, because di something divided by 3 is obviously smaller than something divided by 2. Um, but this is, it's a useful sanity check to compare to what you're expecting. Are the, are the mass ranges in my library what I would expect? So here's a difference. So you can see that in, the, in their analysis, they had uh, Q3s, fragment ions, up to 2,000, whereas we only took fragment ions up to 1,500 because that's what we're looking for in our SWAT. There's really not that much above it. So we don't bother with it. We just, we just look up to 1,500 because, again, we want to do our cycle time so that we can sample across the peak. Um, so yeah, there's all these different things. And, and they probably, I mean, I, I'm showing it to you. you. Guys in the back can't even see what it is. But um, if, you, if you're trying to assess the validity of your library, it's actually very helpful. And we have had a number of occurrences where uh, this has helped us a lot. So again, retention time is very uh, important for for analysis. So we're using something called IRT peptides. And IRT peptides are peptides that you're meant to put in lots, of, pretty much all of your runs. And they help you to, to register the, the retention times between the runs. And it just so happens, for some reason, that they're, they go from negative to positive. And so the, the reason that these show up as negative value from negative 60 to 180 is basically because they've been converted into what we call IRT space. So that's, that's a little unusual. But it's a dead giveaway if you're looking at a library that, that um, you know, if, if these ranges don't make sense, then it's, it's a red flag to look at something. So, so one other thing, there's a, a measure of consistency. So as I, as I mentioned, sometimes you see multiple charge states of the same ion. And it turns out, when you make a spectral library, <coughs> You, uh, the software treats everything independently. And um, so it you end up getting potentially different charges for your plus 2 and plus 3 of the same peptide. Now, that doesn't make any sense from the perspective that when, you, when your peptide's eluding, it's not like your plus 3 elutes here and your plus 2 elutes here. Really, the peptide elutes and then you do your ionization, and the ionization either, either causes a plus 2 or a plus 3. So you would hope that your plus 2 and your plus 3s would be very close to each other. But it turns out that they're not. <coughs> um, and in some cases, we found libraries where these numbers are very different. Um, so here are two libraries that are in the, uh, in the Swath Atlas. And basically, oops, sorry. Um, and so what we're looking at is plus 2 and plus 3 charges. And so this one has a very good correlation. So having used the IRT peptides, everything is pretty much right along the diagonal. So um, this is basically, we take in all the peptide ions that you have the plus 2 and the plus 3 for exactly the same modified peptide and plotted them against each other. So you'd expect, in a perfect world, they'd just lie down on this, on this axis. But you see that there are some outliers. And the width of this is kind of, you know, kind of big. So you know you could look at this and say, well, you know that's actually, you know, plus or minus five minutes or plus or minus three minutes, something like that. So that can help you to decide how wide of a, wide of a, a, a sort of window that you look at when you're trying to to look for these things. So this is a yeast library, and actually it's got a, a pretty strong correlation as well. Everything lies a little bit better along the axis, but we have sort of more pronounced outliers. Um, so this is just an example of how IRT can, can vary. And it, it illustrates why we might look at this in our, our libraries. So this is, this is sort of another thing. Um, so basically, in addition to storing the retention time, these libraries have 
uh, what they consider to be the best spectrum. So, so we've taken, you know, between, well, one and, and 100 different spectra and made the co best consensus that we could. So uh, Spectrast will pick one peptide that either has the highest signal or has the lowest signal to noise, depending on how you have it set up. Um, and so all this shows is that if you pick pairs of peptides in the blue, where, where basically the, the retention time, the difference between the minimum retention time seen for this ion and the maximum retention time seen for the ion is pretty close, then you get a much better correlation between the median retention time and this best replicate spectrum. Um, so library completeness is basically taking a a proteome, so most of you, if you're working with some sort of organism, you have a proteome or a genome that you want to compare to. Um, and this just looks at those things and says, okay, of, of the things that I might expect to see, of the peptides I might expect to see, of the proteins I might expect to see, how many of them do I actually see in this library? And it gives you an idea of how complete the library is. And for most of these things, the, the two different libraries, even though we've cut this one down, don't really vary that much. Um, one thing that's kind of uh, interesting to note is, is the, the average number of peptides per protein is seven, but the median peptides per protein is like 17. So it turns out the, the PHL is, is pretty overrepresented in some, some proteins are over, overrepresented. You have up to, say, 100 peptides for that protein, including some things that are, are uh, semi triptic or have missed cleavages. So normally for SRM, you wouldn't want to use that type of peptide. You'd want the, sort of the best representative peptides for each protein. So that's one thing we might want to do with the, the PHL is, is narrow it down a little bit. And I'll get some more evidence of that later. So actually one caveat. So basically, this is the number of triptych peptides. This is the number of perfectly triptych peptides that match the perfectly triptych peptides here. So 20% of the entire proteome covered in this library um, we know that there is about 12,000 out of 20,000. So we know that we've only covered 60% of the proteins. Um, so those proteins, we're just not getting perfect coverage. So, so yeah, you might think that this number is pretty small compared to the 500,000. Um, yeah, you, you may well be right. Um, it may be a, a function of, of sort of uh, quality criteria that were, were applied here, but I mean, it's, it's a very rare uh, mass spec experiment or set of experiments that can see 100,000 different peptides from, from human. Um, so, so these things are actually uh, things that are, are wrong with the library. And, and you might not think that it's possible, but it turns out that you can, you can actually have improper M disease. And because we're accepting things at Swath Atlas, we want to make sure that people submit a database and we're then providing it for the community. We want to make sure that there's not something wrong. Um, and so, by and large, these numbers are all okay. Um, these are things comparing the swath files that you provided with the, uh, the actual library. And so, so, generally speaking, you look at all these things and there's like four or five of them that stand out to you. And, you know, as somebody who actually play, works with these libraries quite a bit, I have, I have used this uh, a number of times. Um, anyway, so I know that's, that's pretty boring. Here's a little bit of, of, of a description of why we might want to have good libraries. So, so as a test, basically, I took this library that we're talking about, um, and this, these are the, uh, and it's, it's only sort of a subset of the PHL. And so these are the, the minimum, maximum, and uh, median retention time. And so I did two different things. So first of all, I took randomly uh, added or subtracted up to 10 Daltons from every peptide. So uh, maybe I added one and subtracted three and added 10 and subtracted two. Uh, so basically, it's randomized. And you can see that the minimum does go down by about 10. The maximum doesn't really go up. And the median stays the same, because I've, I've done this randomly, and so I've sort of added as much as, as I've subtracted. In this case, basically, I took and did a fixed RT. So basically, I said, every peptide in here, I'm going to add 10 minutes. And then I'm going to use this, this library for a swath analysis, and I'm going to see how the software uh, can handle it. So, between these two things, so, so this is the, sort of the baseline library. I've done a random thing where each individual change is probably less, but it's plus or minus. And in this case, I've added 10 to everything. So everything in here is moved by 10 minutes. 
So which one do you think gave the worst results? The, the one where I randomly added plus or minus, and the, the magnitude is, is probably averages around five, or the one where I added 10 to everything? Who thinks, who thinks that the random one would be the worst? Who thinks the fixed one would be the worst? Who has no idea? <laughs> OK. No one's going to play. Fixed one is the problem. That is correct. So basically, this is, uh, this is a so-called whisker plot, box and whisker plot. Uh, the box and whisker plot, basically, uh, this is the median of your data. This is the first quartile. This is the third quartile. And this is the minimum and maximum. Um, although there is some outlier, done, outlier detection done, and so sometimes you can actually get some things below the minimum or above the maximum. Um, but basically, it shows that the, the library that we started with has very narrow tolerance. I mean, everything we're getting, so this is 15 different samples. We're seeing how many, basically, HeLa peptides were seen. And in this case, each of our analyses came up with about uh, yeah, 18,100, very tightly grouped. When we did these two retention time perturbations, we actually saw a significant decrease in not only the number that we see, but also the, the um, consistency across the different replicates that we see. So in a similar vein, basically, we took the Q1 and Q3 values, um, and we added, um, basically, modified by 40 ppm uh, the Q1s, or we modified by 40 ppm the Q3s. So in this one, which would, be, which would have more of an effect? We're taking these big Q1 chunks, and then we're, then we're basically uh, fragmenting them all and then analyzing the Q3 versus modifying the Q3, which is actually what we're reading out. Who thinks the Q1 will be a worse thing? Q3 would be worse. And that is exactly right. So the Q1, you're not really doing much. You, you Maybe a couple of them, you're going to move it from one swath to another. But most of them are going to stay in the same swath. And so it doesn't really matter. You're just looking at basically the, you're looking at the same ions, and it's still in the same swath. But in the case of the Q3, a, a change of 40 ppm, again, causes a drastic decrease in the number of uh, peptides observed, although it didn't affect as much the sort of reproducibility. So I'm going to talk about one sort of real world example. Um, so basically, we took uh, a HeLa. Do you guys know what HeLa cells are? They're a, they're a cell line. It's one of the oldest cell lines. It was taken from some poor woman back in the early uh, mid 1990s and, and was grown uh, from, from a cancer. It was it sort of the first cell line that became available and it's still in use today. And then we spiked in these halo peptides at different concentrations. And there's nothing special about the halo peptides. It's just a different organism than human. And so what we wanted to see is if we have this complicated background, can we see these, these halo peptides that we spiked in? I, so the diff, five different dilutions. And in the data I'm going to show, it goes from four femtomol to one nanomol. There's three replicates of each tested on nano and microflow LC. Two different instruments interpreted with four different software tools. Excuse me. So if you look at all the replicates, times it, machines, and everything, there are actually 360 different measurements for each point. Um, and so we basically took it and ran against the PHL, and this is what we saw. So basically, uh, the, these are the two. Full, this is a log transformed because when you have ratio data, you always take the log. Um, and ideally, this would be right at two. And so what we've done is we've taken, and so this is sort of the twofold. We're basically taking the ratio of everything to the most concentrated sample. So this E sample has the most things in it. And so we, we take the, and so pretty much anything in D is also going to be an E, and anything in C is also going to be an E. So this is most concentrated, less concentrated, less concentrated down here. Um, so by the time we get to the very low femtomol uh, sample, we only see four or five. So actually, the number that we see is here. So out of these 475 peptides we spiked in, we're only seeing 204. And that, actually, this is peptide ions. And so there's going to be in excess of 500 possible things. And we're only seeing about half of them, or, or it, really 40%. And so we looked at that and we thought, well, that's not too good. I mean, we have reasonable quantitation. I mean, the, everything was lining up on the, where it should on those axes. Um, but we had poor agreement between the, all the replicates. So what we did is we looked at all the different uh, 
different experiments, and we picked peptides that were seen in exactly, were seen in all three replicates of any one uh, technique or software, what have you. And we can created a subset database from this list. So basically, the, the PHL had about 147,000 peptides. Our new div database had 40,000 peptides. So what we've done is taken a repository library and we've focused it on our sample. Um, and so the reason for this is basically the way that people do big data nowadays. You take all these measurements and you don't try to threshold, you don't try to decide what's good, you don't try to take Excel and pick a cutoff. What you do is you make some sort of statistical model and you try to separate the true positives from the, the negatives or, or the, yeah, anyway. So as you go here, um, as you push, as you push this way, you get more and more sensitive. You get more and more things that you might not have gotten. But as you go this way, you actually lose your specificity because you start getting these negative things in with your positives. And so what you try to do is pick a point where you have an acceptable FDR. And the thing is, with a big swath library, you don't expect to see everything in there. And so we're, all these things use decoys, and so you expect to have a one-to-one -one ratio of decoys to properly model this. But if, you're, if you don't see 60% of your swath library, and you make decoys for 100%, you basically have, basically you only have about 20% true forwards and about 80% decoys. So, so because you don't see everything in your library, having a big library in, eff, in effect increases your number of decoys. And that is hard to model. And so by cutting that down, we hoped that we'd have a better result. And it turned out that we did. So basically, this is the same thing analyzed with the other library. And you can see that now we see in excess of 500 things. They're still pretty close. This is pretty close to plus point, uh, to minus two. This is pretty close to minus four. And we now see you know, 23 of these, these lowest concentration ones. So I'll go back. It went from here to here. Um, and so basically, these, these lines along the bottom are a density plot. So kernel density basically gives you an idea of how these things are spread out. Because if you look at this cloud of things, it's kind of hard to tell. But you can see that these things are a little bit misshapen. Um, and that's an indication that you know, there's something a little bit weird about your data. Um, this one has a pretty pronounced shoulder. And so sometimes what we do is we actually cut this one off at a, a CV, a, a coefficient of variation of, say, 20%. So we exclude data that is problematic. But by, even by doing that, we get a much cleaner peak. And this, this uh, density plot gets uh, more nicely shaped. Um, but we still have far more. So by using a smaller library, we've actually achieved, we've seen, we've done better quantitation on more peptides. Um, and this is another way to look at the same thing. This is looking at just the HeLa background. So this previous one, these are all the halo peptides. This is looking only at the HeLa background. And even in the HeLa peptides, yeah, here we saw, you know, on average about 14,000. But here we saw over 16,000 on average. And as I said, you know, sometimes this is max and min, but because they do outliers, sometimes you have outliers out here. Um, so this is an indication that, that targeting your library. So, so we think that, that um, library resources are good, but you, you still have to do some focusing. It's, it's good because you don't have to do all your own DDA, but it does require some customization. And I think that feeds in well with, with the proteome, uh, proteogenomic theme. So SWATH is an important MS uh, uh, technique. It, it has the ability to be reanalyzed forever. Um, you get better depth than DDA. Um, and as long as you, since you can, you can reanalyze forever, as, as our knowledge of the proteome space and our, our libraries improve, uh, you're going to be able to reanalyze the same data and, and get better results. Um, library quality does matter. Um, I, I really think that Docker is a useful thing, especially for somebody who's who's not that technically savvy. It's pretty easy to install, and then you just have to go browse around for things and, and r run them. Um, and comprehensive resource libraries save time. You don't have to do your own DDA, but they should be tailored before use. And again, I think that leads into proteogenomics, because what if you had some genomic data, and then you took one of these resource libraries, and you said, OK, I, you know, I think that in my genomic data, it tells me that I should see all these things. And so now you make a much more focused proteomics library, and you have a better chance of actually seeing what you're looking for.
in today's lecture you were introduced to the library assessment feature of swath atlas which provides recommendations to improve the dia experiment the dia library qc workflow considers features such as library complexity precursor and fragment peptide characteristics retention times library completeness while assessing an ion library we hope now you can appreciate the use of tools like srm atlas peptide atlas and swath atlas in carrying high quality mass spectrometry based proteomics research thank you